right, welcome to the Cruise Asset Management Quarterly Market Call. It's myself, Stuart Cruz, and John Brick, CFA, here on the call to give you our quarterly market outlook. Um, we'll wait for some attendees to show up. We'll get started in a few minutes. John, how are you feeling about things right now? Feeling good. Um, outside of the market, it's becoming fall time, and I got my nice vest on, and you know, fall is my favorite time of the year. So, feeling great. Hey, you got a half dozen of those vets, vests in our office right now. I take some of those. Never have enough. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Well, the market bell just rang. Um, we finished, finished down a little bit, huh? A little mixed market today. All right, well, let's get started. So again, I welcome everybody to the Cruise uh, Cam Quarterly Market Outlook Call. Again, we try to change things up a little bit. Instead of just talking about what we think is going to happen in the market, which we will, we're going to add a couple of uh, hopefully practical things or uh, discussion points about our virtual family office, which will revolve around tax because uh, personal tax deadline extensions coming up. I know a lot of CPAs are in overdrive working on that. And now is a pretty good time to get working on some of your tax uh, mitigation strategies before the year end. So you're not trying to do everything on December 30th, right? Okay, so let's jump in. We're gonna try and keep this short and sweet because really not much of the market has changed all that much. We're still expensive. Um, we're still uh, cautiously optimistic. Momentum is still on our side. Uh, they are starting to get a little bit more, a few cracks here and there in the armor. So let's just talk about a couple of them here. So I'm going to share my screen and John's going to tell me if he can see my screen, which I'm sure he can. I can. So instead of going over some of the same old slides we did before, I'm just going to point this one out. This is from our JP Morgan's guide to the markets. They put it out quarterly. As you know, we love data here and this is pretty data intense. So if we look here at the levels of the S&P and you can see these nice little green bars that are lines put in place of like when the market ran up and when it fell off and when it ran up and when it fell off. So here we're looking, the market hit a PE of 19.2 and then crashed and crashed back down to uh, 13. So that was COVID. And then it hit again, a PE of 21.4 and then crashed down a little bit. And now here we are at 21 and a half. So We've seen numbers higher than that. This is the dot-com boom, 25. I don't want to really emulate that. That wasn't great, but we're in some lofty territory. And everybody's seen this chart before. Here's our long-term PE average of 16 and change. We're 21 and a half, as we just mentioned. Not too many times have we been up here. And if we look, again, I'm going through these slides fast because we've done this before. Five-year subsequent forward returns from where we're at. So where are we at PE wise? What were the next five years? When you look at the data plots, you're basically kind of nestling up to zero, 0% 0 returns over the next five years on average. Now here are one year returns. You can get some monster returns or some really bad ones, but long-term, if we're looking out, we think these returns are going to be pretty lackluster. And this would go to you probably need to be nimble. You need to be tactical and be in and out of the markets during particular times. That's what we're hoping to get. If you get much higher than this 21, you get up to 22, we have never seen positive five-year returns. This is not great news for the marketplace. Okay, um, other things I wanna to talk to you about is uh, really the um, concentration of the returns we'll see, we've seen. So everybody talks about, oh, before I get to that, again, average multiples, this shows value, blend, and growth, and large cap, mid cap, small cap. So if you break this down in the normal morning star boxes, what were the past PEs and where are we at now? And here's the ratio. So large cap value, we're 121% over our long-term average. Large cap blend, 136. Growth, one, call it 150. There's not a number in here where we're at average, which could be expected. So there's not even a, an area here where we're like, oh, this is a decent value. Not even small cap value is cheap. It's actually a little expensive. So this is, again, not great news. Um, other things to talk about in the marketplace is the uh, potential rising. Now, this is recession determinants. I don't see a lot of red here. So there, there's not a lot of indicators that suggest we're about to go into a recession. So I'm not thinking about that. 
but at the same time, the yield curve just de-inverted. So the 10 year over the two, the 10 years now earning more than the two year. Normally when that happens, and I'll bring up that chart, if there's going to be a recession, this is kind of when it happens. So if I look at this um, 10 year chart, here is the 10 years in the orange line, the two year is in the purple. And for a while we were inverted where the two year was above the 10, okay? So if I add the 210 spread and take off these other two things, so this is the 10 year minus the two. So whenever it's positive, we're normal. Whenever it's negative, we are inverted. So here we were inverted. This is the zero line, inverted, inverted, inverted. I'm gonna go out max inversion and then add recessions. So as you can see, whenever we go, that's the zero line. So we were inverted and then we went positive and had a recession. Inverted, went positive, had a recession. Inverted, went positive, recession. So here we were inverted for a very long time. We just turned positive. I'm not saying we're gonna have a recession because there's not a lot of indicators that suggest that, but if we were, it would be coming in the next three to six months, right? So the only thing that I really see cracks in the armor are a couple of things. This talks about flows into early delinquencies of debt. So auto and credit card flows into early delinquencies are up. This is a 10 year average. We're kind of, I don't know, well above our 10 year average. Now credit card student loans, I'm sorry, student loans are down because of the programs, but these are things that could slow the velocity of money throughout the economy. And then the other area that I'd be concerned with would be unemployment. So unemployment's this line in black, we hit a peak here and it's come way down, way down, way down. And it bottomed out and now it's been ticking up for the last year or so. And if you notice, whenever you kind of have a trough and starts ticking up, these are potentially recessionary indicators, like not quite ready, but maybe sometime in the future. So um, thoughts about that, John? Do you want to talk about maybe a, a, a counter to that was uh, China? Yeah, well, I think it, I think you have a very astute opinion on the unemployment right there ticking up. I think um, just add a bullet point that historically we've talked about interest rates being a big risk to the market, or it kind of feels balanced where it's now interest rate risks are still part of the risk, but now the unemployment's the other half. So a balanced risk to watch. Yeah. Um, but I think going back to one of the slides you had about the one year projected return, Something to watch that just happened this week, China unleashed a bazooka, as the media is calling it, of monetary stimulus. And uh, the large cap index that tracks the Chinese internet and large stock, um, which is a lot of the large internet names, is up almost 30% in seven days. So the, um, the Chinese government has long been watching and trying to starve off a recession and they are, are getting sick of it and just unloaded stimulus. So maybe that chart on the left that says the one year return is kind of a, a, a wild guess wild given guess. the elections here, yep. um, which there won't be anything crazy happening and um, Chinese bazookas of stimulus, maybe we see some positive markets over the next six months to a year. Um, and what Stuart's talking about is the recession watch will continue to incubate under the surface and um, just just a data point, but we're watching. Yep. And, you know, I'm going to throw up a chart here. Momentum works. Here's the S&P 500, a 10 year window. Every one of these candlesticks is a month. And so and everything point. looks up and to the right that momentum works in the marketplace. So we are. There's nothing that doesn't say that the market can't get more expensive from here. And in fact, usually when it's gotten here, it has gotten more expensive. So Do you want to ch change it to monthly? It's a monthly. You're on a weekly. Oh, that's weekly. You're right. And you should, and we could show, yeah, yeah. bingo. The, the real big determining factor of 20, uh, 2022 where we sidestepped um, right there. Do you want to point that out again? We'll be watching for that again in case we do go through this bad market. You know, we have our indicators here to, to watch it. Yep. Um, other things we wanted to talk about, 
or I wanted to talk about was with respect to the forward markets um, was CPI and the stickiness of some of the interest rates. So let's get my computer rolling here. Um, we're went a little too far. We are counting on the Fed to bring interest rates down. And they've been doing, I think they've been doing a great job. My analogy is always that they are basically trying to drive a car where they, every time they touch the steering wheel or the brake, the, the response is delayed, it's not instantaneous. And so they have to figure out how to do this. Um, and it's a challenge. So, and, and this, the, the information that they're getting in their, in their uh, windshield is not also instantaneous, it's at a nine second delay. So can you imagine driving your car with nine second delay coming at you? And then every time you turn the steering wheel, hit the brake, it's also delayed. You're, you're fine if you're going straight, but if you're going to have, see a turn, you're going to crash your car. So that's, I think they've done a great job, but it's going to be a challenge. So now here's their headline CPI. As you can see their target is in this range, which is where they've been. And we spiked up and now they've been kind of stuck here, stuck a little higher than what they want. So, you know, what's going to change that? Is it going to be a potential recession? I don't, I don't know. I looked at this Fed funds rate. The, here are the projections. If you look during these downturns, these are all recessions in these downturns. Every single one of these big downturns are recessions. So what the market is suggesting is we have cuts to here and we stop perfectly. We stick the landing, you know, and then we just go right into, hey, we're good. And I just, maybe, I mean, maybe. <laughs> so I'm just not that confident. I don't know. So that's where we're at. So we're, we're following the momentum. Market's moving forward. We're going to continue to uh, be invested until the signals say don't be invested anymore. But uh, we're cautiously optimistic, especially in this election year, that tends to be pretty good. So with that in mind, uh, some of the names that we are invested in, John's going to talk about. Yep. Um, could you uh, allow me to share? So what I wanted to do was quickly for about one and a half or two minutes to scroll through and show some of the CAM conviction names that we have, which are growth focused. And um, Stuart, can you see my charting? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we usually have about 10 names in the, in the mix at any given period. And so I'll just spend a quick second on each and, and, and kind of give some thoughts. And the other thing on my mind is to show you some of the technicals on the chart and um, discuss the, some of the process. So Palantir, which is kind of the catch all for data AI, as you can see, has gone vertical. And a lot of people are talking about the very bright future. We own, we own some of this. BST, Vista Corp, it's a utility. We bought in before this big uh, rise. We're, we were bought in, I think, in the 90s. Um, Three Mile Island is a nuclear power plant that uh, has been repurposed again, or not repurposed, turned back on from Microsoft. All the AI boom needs uh, energy, and Vista is part of the um, uranium and nuclear uh, industry. And so that stock price is appreciated. Sentinel One, cybersecurity, CrowdStrike is the is the big brother. Sentinel One is the baby brother. And uh, CrowdStrike had a big data breach or a big a big IT breach. I, I don't know if it was a breach, a big IT issue. So a lot of people are saying that Sentinel One will be picking up the slack. So we have exposure to cybersecurity. So, uh, Service now package software, just like Palantir, when you have a bunch of software and analytics, the machine learning and the data gathering of the of the uh, technology that's coming out and the robotics is going to be a big tailwind to uh, a company like Service now. We have exposure to Hood, Robin Hood. I'll skip through some of these. Irene Energy is renewable data center. How met aerospace? Look at that chart is aerospace and defense. Amazon, we did have some uh, Northern Trust exposure, high dividend, bank, just want a little banking exposure for lower rates. Meta, we all know what Meta does. Transmedics, 
one of my favorites. They are pioneering a new industry where vital organs, think of liver, heart, and others are being transported from hospital to hospital. Mostly that's done by public service and public hospitals. There's, they're pioneering an industry where they're a private third party and they're picking up a lot of uh, new business. Copang, Amazon of South Korea, TGTX, TG Therapeutics, and Mercado Libro, the Brazilian uh, Amazon. So all of these are in for a reason, just a refresher that we look at the earnings growth, we look at the multiples, and we look at the relative strength of these stocks trading versus the other stocks that we monitor. And what I like to do is look at these moving averages on the screen, the green line and the blue line. And we, when, when we show some major breaking down, like my favorite, I just said, uh, if we do see some sustained weakness, we'll start trimming and we'll start adding to stocks that maybe are showing positive strength, like BST. So I just wanna take a quick second to run down what we own currently and a few thoughts. Um, I have two other bullet points on my uh, note sheet here. So the first, Stuart alluded to the graph of a stock sharing. Stuart alluded to the interest rates being cut. So there's two actionable items. First is we want to get some cash off the sidelines. Um, CDs and money market accounts and banks are, are going to start yielding a lot less, probably closer to 3%, if not lower. So you're, um, you know, we can find a lot of ways to put that money to work, even in some principal protected notes or other ways to have virtual um, risk-free investments. And lastly, the structured notes we use are all hinged upon interest rates. And so um, the days of uh, our 200% upside notes, we had a, a, a lot of them in, in the system. But given the interest rates are coming down a little bit, we may start to see over the next year, the structured notes go from 200% upside to maybe 180 to 170. They'll trip down, trickle down as the interest rates come down. So I um, guess I'm being a little salesy here, but uh, if there is any excess cash that you want it to be deployed in these long-term notes, um, in the next three to six months, it's probably the window to do it before those numbers drop down under 200%. Um, those are my three bullet points, and I'll turn it back to you, Stuart. I think some year-end tax things. Yeah, I think we'll be back and forth. So as a virtual family office, as we discussed, the family office is, for those of you who don't know, um, it's where a family has so much money that they hire a team of professionals to work only on optimizing their own wealth, like think of Rockefellers. And in today's day and age, you need 500 million and above to have your own family office, roughly. But a lot of our clients here can need some of those services some of the time, and they certainly prefer if we are working in conjunction with other experts. So we work with CPAs and tax mitigation specialists and, and insurance providers and a variety of other people so that we're working to optimize our clients' results as opposed to when you're at a large brokerage firm, we weren't allowed, I'm, you're still not allowed to talk to anybody outside your firm really and collaborate because the compliance department can't control what the CPA says or what the insurance provider says or whatnot. So they just don't take the risk or the exposure. As fiduciaries here, Kim, it's my opinion, the only way we can provide you with the best possible solution is through collaboration. I mean, I'm sure you want your teammates playing together, right? You want your experts playing together nicely and that's the whole goal. So here we are in tax mitigation season. I know my CPA partners are going crazy right now because the personal tax extension is uh, uh, October 15th. So they're busy, busy, busy. We've been presenting them with a bunch of ideas. I'll probably have John come in and talk about some of these, but very popular was what we call oil and gas. Um, our company, they, they're they drilling in the Permian Basin alongside all the other big boy uh, refiners. And the, the top line of what the clients really want is this deduction. So for every $100,000 that is invested in a, this strategy, 93, they get a $93,000 deduction off their taxes. That's awesome. The target is to get a 2X return on that $100,000 in the next eight to 10 years. Start paying dividends in the first six months. Um, you can imagine if you're creating projects where you're drilling somewhere in the Permian Basin, 
the income is going to start off slower, it's going to pick up, and then it's going to start to ramp down as the assets deplete in the seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year range. So um, again, hard numbers, put in $100,000, get a $93,000 deduction. If you're in a 40% tax bracket, that's going to cost you, you know, whatever, $40,000. So your net still out 60. But if you get a return of $200,000 in dividends, that's roughly a 3x return on your net cash outlay in eight to 10 years. Those are great returns, great numbers. Um, John, do you want to add anything to that? You're an expert. We did five to 10 million of that last year. Yeah, um, it's a good overview. I think uh, just operationally, that does fill up before the end of the year. So we may want to look to get an allocation and paperwork done in the next 45 days from now. Um, and then I'll just round that out by saying the income that is produced is a very interesting uh, part of the tax code where they consider a passive income as if as almost like real estate. People love real estate for the tax reasons. So you can get a lot of other tax planning done on the backside of that. In addition to what Stuart is saying about the upfront deduction, you could also have some strong tax uh, planning there and after. So back yeah. to you. Um, so I, routinely I get this. I had people that are not super crazy about the oil and gas industry. You know, that's totally fine. They don't want to support that industry. We can go to the other side of that spectrum and go into solar, renewable energy. So it's not going to be nearly as much of a windfall as the, um, as the oil and gas, but the solar side, instead of getting deductions, you get a dollar for dollar tax credit. So let's say you're going to have a hundred thousand dollar tax bill. The IRS allows you to buy up to 75% or $75,000 worth of solar assets. So that's $75,000 that you redirect from the IRS to a solar asset. So you're not out any cash at all. Um, we can go through the, the particulars of this for sure, but what ends up happening again, not super uh, lucrative, but what ends up happening over the next five years, you get another roughly 20% over that five years of additional deductions on your taxes due to depreciation and the like. In year six, the person who owns, who has the solar panels installed on their building, it's not you, it's somebody else somewhere. There's an actual physical solar asset that you have installed somewhere. They have the option to buy it from you or lease the energy back. And most of them just continue to lease the energy back, which starts to create a revenue stream for you of roughly another 20% for the next six to 10 years. So not 20% every year, 20% total. So you put in a hundred, let's say you put in $75,000, you're going to get 20% back or 15,000 in the form of deductions over the next five years and another 15,000 in the form of uh, income over the years six through 10. So, so you go, so what? Not great. But if you continue to, instead of paying taxes to the IRS, you just buy solar assets every quarter, you start to build up this residual amount of income that starts flowing over time. And it starts to make a difference, okay? And some people really hate paying the government money. So you can buy solar assets and make the world a better place, net, net. Um, other things that are pretty popular with us are what we call the ICLAT, it's Charitable Leads Annuity Trust. So as most people know, if I were to give $100 to charity, I get a $100 deduction. If I'm in the 40% tax bracket, that the charity still got 100 bucks. I get a $100 deduction, but at the 40% tax bracket, it ends up costing me $60. So I'm out 60, charity gets 100, cool. Well, on a bigger amount, there's a better way to do this. So you can put money into an ICLAT, which is a trust. Say you put in $100,000, actually the minimums are higher, but let's put in $100,000 for round numbers. You don't, the charity does not get that $100,000. The trust gets the $100,000. The trust is on a charitable payout schedule for the next 15 or 20 years. It starts off very small. So maybe $2,000. You have to give a charity $2,000, charity of your choosing, but the rest of the money stays in the trust to grow over the next 15 to 20 years. That amount that is scheduled to go out to the charity in the following year goes up by 20% every single year. So if you gave out $2,000 this year, it'd be 2,400 the next year and 28, I don't know, 96 or whatever that number is the year after that. At the end, these numbers start to get pretty large. 
but your trust has had a chance to grow over time. So if we model this out, what we see is over the course of the 20 year period, the charities end up with about a 150% charitable um, gifting of the initial contribution. So you put in hundred thousand dollars, charities get about 150 over that 20 years. Whatever remains in the trust at the end of that schedule comes back to the client tax-free. So great. So now we're faced with what do we do? Do how do we we can invest the money however we want? If we invest it really conservatively, and let's say, let's say the trust just runs out of money. So we invested conservatively, or maybe we invested really aggressively and it just didn't work out, and the trust runs out of money. The person who created the trust is not on the hook for that schedule. The trust just dissolves. Okay, we can talk to legal about this, but that's my understanding. That's every, the answer I've gotten every single time. Trust just dissolves. So if you underperform, there's no penalty. If you perform exactly in line with the trust hitting the schedule, you break even. If you take on, let's say, the risk of the S&P over 20 years, which is averaged around 9%, what we project is the, the return back would be a 3x. So you put in $100,000, you get $300,000 back tax-free. So instead of just giving the money to charity, you can build up a pretty nice uh, nest egg for the charities, and you can also get some money back to your state tax-free. So we think that's an excellent strategy as well. Um, what else we got? So there's a handful of other strategies. There's a Native American strategy that's also tax credits. Some of these have capacity, so we need to start talking about them now. Um, solar is probably for the rest of the year is probably done-ish, but we can still talk about it so that if you're paying quarterly estimates in Q1, don't pay those quarterly estimates, just buy solar assets. And then you don't have any estimates to pay. Um, any other strategies you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I would just publish a uh, public service announcement kind of thing at two. Um, first and the easy one is uh, if you have kids over eight years old, we kind of want to remind you that if you have kids over eight and you do have a business or a 1099 sole proprietorship, um, paying your kids has tremendous tax benefits for your business and passing money to your kids tax free and also allows uh, your kids to start opening up a Roth or an IRA. And so um, if anyone has kids that are over eight and you have a business, let's discuss that. And then more actionable for us and then an asset management standpoint, um, 721 Upreit. It's one of my new favorite ideas. So just the bullet points quickly. If you have physical property that you have for real estate purposes, investment purposes, you have a rental, um, you lease it out. We have the ability to transfer that property through transactions into a public REIT that uh, can sit at Schwab and it's very clean and your cost basis is carried with you. A lot of people don't want to exit their real estate because they have to pay all the tax on the backside. Well, this strategy allows you to carry the cost basis forward. And um, the REITs that we could turn you or put you into are ones we use or could use on a daily basis. So uh, anyone out there that has physical property or knows anyone that has physical property that's getting sick of managing it, I think we have a very strong solution and maybe um, we, we could do a webinar on this particular topic by itself, but I just wanted to kind of public service announcement to get people thinking about it. Um, so I had. Yeah, sounds good. Um... I think that's really all we talked about because we're in tax season and we're trying to keep this at 30 minutes. So it looks like we're right there. So um, again, just to recap, multiples are still high in the market. They're getting higher, getting more expensive. It's no shock, but momentum tends to work in the marketplace and things tend to get more and more expensive over time. Um, and they tend to get to the point of I don't know, euphoria or fraud, like overextended to beyond the point of rationality. And I don't think we're quite there yet. We don't see a lot of hoopla in the market. So we think we're still gonna have some upside from here. Um, but we're watching, we're watching those indicators to see if there's some turn in the market. Um, in the tech side, like if we're looking at NVIDIA's chart, those are forming lower highs and lower lows. So 
you know, I wouldn't be super crazy about chasing some of those stocks necessarily, but um, those high flyers, but the overall market, uh, if we get some broadening of the, the depth, because we've had a lot of concentration of returns in the, the MAG7, we get some broadening of that, you could see a lot of upside for the, the main marketplace. Um, again, we're working hard to keep those virtual family office offerings uh, going. We're finding new strategies every single day. We're going to meetings and conferences just to make sure that we're, we're uh, in the know on a lot of these things. John's done a lot of work on alternatives. So if we don't think the stock market's going to do well for the coming years, alternatives and private equity and some of these different strategies, they are not at frothy levels right now. And in fact, some of the numbers that we've seen, they're under their long-term averages. So these could be good ways to shift and rotate some of your money out of just the stock market and into areas that have probably better longer-term prospects. Okay. So with that, please feel free to give us a call, Stuart and John. Um, this is Cruise Asset Management and their quarterly call and we appreciate you watching and stay tuned. And um, we always say we like to invest with the odds in your favor.